Good morning. Good morning. Great to have you here this morning. My name is John, the pastor. Great to be around uh, with you. Uh, when you were walking in, you were handed a few things. One, you were handed a ticket to vote uh, for your favorite Lamar donut. Hopefully you did that because we are all out of donuts. We are, they're gone. Hopefully you had your vote. I can announce the winner if you'd like to know who won. Would you like to know who won? The Maple Donut won today. Maple people unite. Yay, Maple. Uh, won by three votes uh, over the old-fashioned donut. So um, every vote counts. You got to get the vote out. If you're a Maple person, you got the vote out. Way to go. You were also handed a little program uh, with a bunch of different things inside of there. One's a communication card. I begin to fill out as much of that as you feel comfortable filling out. You can put that along with your offering in the baskets that are going to be passed later. Great way to let us know if we can pray for you in any way. If, uh, if there's some question you might have about God, about journey, let us know on that uh, card and we would get back to you um, ASAP. I've been going down to Mexico here over the last uh, uh, month or so quite a bit, uh, more than usual. Uh, I work for a nonprofit called The Hope Effect, and we're trying to change the way the world is caring uh, for orphans, trying to get as many kids into families as possible. And right now we're working with a government-run orphanage in San Luis, uh, Mexico, which is just across the border from Yuma. And in December, uh, through the generosity of lots and lots of people, we were able to give 89 pairs of shoes, underwear, socks, and throw a party for um, the kids that are in this government orphanage there in this tiny town. And so that was pretty I'm excited to be a part of. While we were there, we learned that about 24 of the kids are sleeping on the floors. And so we're on a mission now to build beds for those children to help them to get off of the floor. And um, we're taking 89 blankets down there through the generosity of people here at Journey. And so we're really trying to help them in very practical ways. Um, and so this last week, I went down once again and we built our prototype beds with uh, our partners down there. And we're getting ready to take a group um, from El Jefe CrossFit. Uh, we're taking a group down there on Saturday, and we're going to bang out all those beds at one time and deliver the beds and the blankets, and, and just going to be um, just going to be a great day. Uh, even though I've been down there a couple different times doing different things, the mission's always been the same, to help the orphans of Sonora. Uh, that is what we're all about, and so while we're doing different things, that's our overarching mission. However, my wife, Christy, reminds me of a greater mission that is above that that she uh, reminds me every time that I go, and it, is a, it, it just really is encapsulated in these words, drive safely, that is the mission. <laughs> the overarching mission as she sees it, for me and her other children that leave the house when they're driving, drive <laughs> safely. She doesn't think I'm a bad driver, I don't think she thinks I'm a bad driver, but her big concern is that we come home. She wants to be with us again. Jesus had a lot of great things to say to us, and he gave us a lot of great um, instructions, some great advice, uh, told us how to change our lives, told us about himself. Uh, but his last words to us, his overarching mission, are found in Matthew chapter 28. Go into all the world and make disciples. This is his last words to us. Go and make disciples of the world. And at, we're going to have our year be our best year yet here at Journey Church. We are going to have to keep this mission right in front of us. We need to keep making disciples uh, the making disciples, the commandment that Jesus has given us as our chief mission, not only uh, today, but throughout the year and on into the future, if this is going to be our best year yet. From the early days here at Journey, we've always dreamt of being a church. Uh, through our programming, through our teaching, through our events, our ministries, we've always sought to be a church that is open to people who are far from God. We've always encouraged you and challenged you and tried to steer you in a direction that you could be a person uh, that loves those and that is open to interacting with those and, and helping people who are far from God find God. This is the type of church that we want to be. It's easy to get distracted in life. And it's easy to get distracted from this chief mission that Jesus has called us on. It's easy to get focused on the things around us or become inward focused and, and be focused on our own selfish things to, to pursue uh, success in some other way. And so for this morning, as we wrap up our series talking about how can we make 2018 our best year yet. I would just like, by way of reminder to most of you and, and by introduction to some of you, I'd like to take this morning to refocus on the mission that Jesus has left us with and answer this question. How can we help people who are far from God take steps of faith here at Journey? How can we help those that are far from God? And that's the majority of the people that are around us in our, in our jobs, in our neighborhoods, 
and maybe even in our families. How can we help people who are far from God take steps closer to God, steps of faith closer to him? I, I picked a passage out of 2 Kings. Um, it's in the Old Testament if you want to start turning there in your Bible or pulling it up on your phone. I have asked the guys to put it on the screen as well. But we're going to be looking at 2 Kings chapter 5, uh, starting in verse 5. We're, we're going to look at this guy's story who was far from God and then started making a journey towards him and see what that really looks like and, and what are some things that we can learn um, from him. Now, before I get into that, just let me pray. God, thank you that you came near to us, that Jesus uh, entered our mess, came into this world, and then entered the mess of our lives and began to transform us. Thank you that you are a lover of people who are far from you. And God, would you just help us to keep our focus on you in this regard, God, that you would help make our church um, have this as a central heartbeat, and that, God, you would use us in this way, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me introduce you to Naaman, and uh, Naaman, who is a warrior who had a leprous disease. Now, Naaman was a commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him, the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now, bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel. Uh, she served as Na Naaman's wife, servant. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. And this is what the king replied, By all means, go. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. A letter that he took to the king of Israel read this, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. Just go ahead and just cure him for me, and that'd be great. Appreciate that. As soon as the king of Israel read this letter, he tore his robe and he said, Am I God? Can I kill or bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the prophet, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him a message. Why have you torn your, torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and I will show him what's up in Israel. I'll, I'll show him what's up. So Naaman went to, with his horses and his chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him and said, Go wash seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out to me, stand and call in the name of the Lord his God, and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. I think he'd seen some televangelists do that, and so that's what he was really hoping for. Are not the rivers of Damascus better than the waters of Israel? Couldn't I have washed in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Now Naaman's servant went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, and the man of God, just like the man of God told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept this gift from your servant. The prophet said, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, please let your servant be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again have a burnt offering or make any sacrifice to any other God but the Lord. But may the Lord forgive your servant of this one thing. When your master enters the temple to bow down to this false god, Ryman, he, and he's leaning on my arm, I will have to bow also. And when I bow down in the temple, may the Lord forgive your servant of this. And Elisha says to him, go in peace. Now, I read this passage here recently in my own devotional time, and uh, as I was preparing for this message, I, I felt like this is the one that we should be talking about here this morning, because I think it gives us a real, uh, some real practical advice and some real, a really good picture as to how we can interact with people who are far from God as they're making their journey towards Him. So just a few things that maybe you want to jot down. Number one, somebody must point people who are far from God in the right direction. 
Somebody's got to be the one to point people in the right direction of God. Naaman was a stud warrior because God uh, would work through him, even though he necessarily didn't know God. Uh, but he was working through him to do these great things, and yet he had this leprous disease. Usually leprosy would make you an outcast, somebody that you would have to become a beggar, you, you would be kind of shied away from. However, because of his skill and because of what uh, God was apparently doing through him, unbeknownst to him, he was winning battles, and so the king gave him some favor and gave him power and riches. And even though he had all of this power, he could not heal himself of this disease that plagued him. Enter in a no-named girl from Israel into the story. We do not know who she is. We're not told a lot about her, but she enters the story and simply points towards God. Hey, if my master would go over and see this man of God, God would be able to do something in his life. I just know it. She spoke up. She urged him to go, and she believed that God would do in his life what he wanted to have done. And while her name's not in the story, we do know a few things about her that are kind of interesting. One, she was a servant of Naaman's wife. This means that it would have been very easy for her to keep her mouth shut. She could have very easily been an individual who said, what am I? I'm just, I'm just a servant girl. Why should I say anything? Obviously, he's a smart warrior. He's got a lot at his disposal. He's probably already considered this or that type of a thing, and she could have just kept her mouth shut. Insecurity or inferiority could have driven her to silence. However, it didn't. It's easy for us to be insecure when it comes to pointing people far from God in the right direction. We worry that maybe we're not qualified or we worry that they might ask us a question that we won't know the answer to and we're going to look a little silly and, and so we feel insecure and we don't share. But she did. She didn't know all of the hows. How is this going to take place? She didn't know all of the answers, but she knew where to point the individual. That's where we need to be as well. But also, did you notice how she became Naaman's wife's servant? She was trafficked there. Some dudes went into Israel, raided a city, and took some young girls captive, and she was one of the young girls that they took captive. And I thought to myself, it would be very easy for her to be bitter, to be resentful, to be angry, maybe even to be vengeful. Instead of pointing them him in the right direction, she could have thought to herself, I know what I'll do. I'll pray that God gives, her, gives him leprosy all over his body. Like, this guy's ruined my life. I want God to ruin his. It's natural to want to point people who like us and who are like us towards God. That's a natural thing to do. If you love somebody, you want to point them to where they can get a loving relationship in their life and where they could be blessed and where their lives could be changed. It's quite another thing to love your enemies in such a way that you point them in the right direction. It's quite another thing to turn the other cheek to bless those who curse us. But this is what God is calling us to do. We don't know how this gal overcame her insecurity and overcame her bitterness, but we sure can be inspired by it. We can be inspired to point people around us in the right direction, whether they are people that are like us or whether they are people that aren't like us and don't even like us at all. People far from God are going to need somebody to point them in the right direction if they're ever going to become a disciple of Jesus. Maybe, just maybe, that somebody is you. People far from God also need somebody to put God on the spot for them. So off Naaman goes to seek healing, and he's looking, he's looking for this healing in his life, and so he loads himself up with cash, with high expectations, and with hope. And he shares with this king, hey, please heal me. And what does the king do? The king freaks out. <laughs> right? The king totally freaks out. And he starts saying, oh my gosh, how am I going to be able to be the one to do this great thing for this individual? Who am I? Am I God? Why is this person trying to trap me? And he, he starts to ask the what if questions. What if God doesn't do this? What if I look stupid? What if this all goes south and all of a sudden I get me and my people all in trouble? What if it keeps us in the predictable and controllable places in our lives? It does not put God on the spot. Elisha, however, steps up to the plate, points to the bleachers and says, God can hit this out of the park. I just know it. He can nail this one. Send him my way. 
realistically, I think it's easier for us to relate to the king in this story than Elisha. We can find these times in our lives where we're asked to step up and put God on the spot, and we shrink back, and we, are, we, we operate in maybe fear at that point. Somebody's really struggling who doesn't know God and asks for prayer. We assure them that God can do amazing things, but it might not be his will, and so you might not want to count on that, and we give God an out. We don't put him on a spot. Somebody's sick and wants comfort. And we pray for comfort, but we stop short of asking for ultimate healing because what happens if it doesn't happen and maybe it'll ruin this person's faith and so we don't put God on the spot. Somebody needs something, maybe a job, a more reliable car, the Patriots are finally losing the Super Bowl and <laughs> we're afraid to put God on the spot and swing for the fences. Somebody needs to hear the message of the hope in Christ and we're not sure God can change them. They're too far gone. They believe the wrong thing for too long. Have you seen what they're doing in their life? So we don't speak. We don't share. We don't extend hope. And we stop short of putting God on the spot in their lives. Folks, while we're uncomfortable at times with putting God on the spot, God is not. I actually think God likes it. As you read the scripture, it seems like God is always like waiting to the last second to finally come through. When all hope seems to be lost and there is no other way, that's when God likes to shine. He likes to be put on the spot as it were. Those people who are far from God in your life need somebody willing to put God on the spot. Maybe, just maybe, that somebody could be you. Also, somebody must be patient. And somebody must encourage progress in their lives. If people far from God are become, going to become disciples, somebody has to walk patiently with them and help them along the way as they go and encourage them along the way. Uh, honestly, it seems like this story should wrap up a bit different than it does. As we kind of initially read it, if we were to write it ourselves, maybe we would, maybe we would want to write it something like this. The king sends this letter and this sick guy to another king. The king of Israel goes, no problem. You got it right here in this place. We got God. Here you go. And, and he sees Elisha. And, and Elisha says, go do this. And the guy doesn't struggle at all. He goes right to the Jordan. He gets all wet and comes out. And the angels break out of, you know, in chorus, singing like Freebird from Leonard Skinner with a guitar solo. It's like this like great moment, like right at the end, right? This is how we kind of think something like this should go, but it doesn't. Uh, we see that he's told, Naaman's told to go and do this, and yet he questions the validity of what he's being asked to do to connect with God. He gets upset. He heads back home, willing to hold on to his disease than do the next thing that God wants him to do. In our modern-day vernacular, how we talk about it here at Journey is we see that Naaman struggles with what it means to follow after God. And this is how it comes out, in anger, in disgust, in frustration. Thankfully, his servant speaks up with amazing wisdom and encourages him to follow through. Naaman calms down eventually, gets dipped in the water seven times and comes out healed. And I wonder if it wasn't for the encouragement of his servant, would he have never seen God work in his life? Would he have given up far too soon? If it wasn't for the encouragement of his servant, Maybe he would have never taken the next step to follow after God. However, that's not the only one who is patient in this, with this new seeker of God in the story. Uh, notice in the text that Elisha is pretty patient with him as well. After he's healed, Naaman says, oh my gosh, this, this God of yours is awesome. I, I'm going to follow this God of yours all of my days, all of my days. Uh, but there's this one problem I'm, I'm, I'm realizing that I'm going to have. See, I'm going to go back to my boss, the king. And he likes to worship this, this false god, and, and uh, I realize that's no god at all, but, you know, my job requires that, that, I, that I kneel down next to the king and, and, and pay homage to this, this false god. And, and so uh, I'm going to ask for forgiveness before I sin. <laughs> can I, I'm just going to ask for it now before I do the wrong thing. Is that good? Can I, can I do that? And I don't expect what Elisha says to come out of his mouth. Because if I was writing the story, or maybe if I was Elisha, I would say something like, what are you talking about? You need to give, God just healed you, man. 
You should totally give your whole life to God. You need to go back to that king and say, I don't care if you cut my head off. I am not following after your false god anymore. Look, I'm clean. And I imagine it like in um, uh, Elisha having like that, that, that kind of moment, like in A Few Good Men. You can't handle the truth if you don't do that. You know, like he's like yelling out. That's how I imagine it to go. But how's it really go? Elisha just says, go in peace. Go in peace. Oftentimes in the scripture we read that God calls people to make radical decisions and it's pretty black and white. Either in or you're out. Either do this or you don't. And it's black and white. And we like that. It, it makes sense to us. It's clear. We understand it. But there are other times, like this, for example, and others as well, where the scripture doesn't seem to paint with black and white, but more with gray brushes. Making disciples is messy business because people are messy. And we aren't so good with messy. We're good with making a point. We're good with pointing things out, but we're not necessarily all that good with messiness of making disciples. But that's what we're called to do. We're not called to make a point. We're called to make disciples. When I was in missions class back in Bible college days, and I was a fairly new follower of Jesus, I remember being pretty black and, black and white, in or out. This is how it goes. And our missions professor posed a question to us. You're a missionary. You go overseas. You run into some culture where they do lots of things that are different than here. And one of the things they do is they have a lot of wives. So the guy that you lead to faith that starts to follow Jesus has four wives and children with each one of those wives. What do you tell him to do? What do you tell him to do? Divorce three of them? Which one does he keep? That if, you, if it's only one man, one woman, how do you handle that? And he posed the question to us, and we had to interact around it. It was very messy. It's also messy when, in one of the countless scenarios in our culture, in our time, in our day right here in Peoria and surrounding communities, when people who are far from God start taking steps of faith closer to him, it can often be pretty messy. An intellectual guy begins to make room for faith in his life for the first time, but he still doubts that anything in the scripture could be true because none of it's scientific. After all, that can get messy. Two senior adults are living together without being married because getting married would cut their benefits in half, and they want to follow Jesus, but they want to keep their insurance. That can get a little messy. You're a diehard political junkie. You are convinced that Jesus has the same political affiliation that you do. There is no way somebody on the other side of the aisle could even claim to know God, let alone really be a Christian, at least not as far as you see it. And then the president of that political party in your local area not only comes to faith but goes to your Bible study at your house, does not want to give up their political affiliation but wants to know Jesus. That can get messy. Two people are committed to each other in a homosexual relationship and they have a child. They want to start to take steps of faith. That can get messy. A San Francisco Giants fan visits your church and <laughs> that can get really messy. <laughs> At least it's not a Dodgers fan. <laughs> we don't like compromise, do we? We think that if we compromise, somehow we're not honoring God. That's a good thing. However, I think there's a difference that we need to learn in our lives when it comes to making disciples. And the difference is between compromise and compassion. If people far from God are going to take steps of faith towards him, somebody is going to need to be compassionate. Somebody is going to need to walk in their shoes. Somebody is going to have to embrace the messy and walk forward through it, patiently encouraging progress. And maybe, just maybe, that somebody could be you. Let me pray for us. God, I just uh, pray that you would help us to be men and women who live like Jesus, who came into a messy world, who saw the messiness of it all. And yet somehow, God, retained compassion and helped us move forward in our lives, 
God, would you help us to be men and women like that? And God, I pray that you would help our church, us right here in this room, be men and women who stay focused on the mission that you have left for us, the overarching mission to make disciples. That that would be part of our heartbeat. That would help us filter our decisions, schedule our lives, and rule our day. Please do this for your glory, for the good of other people, God, and for our good as well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good morning. I'm Carl I, one of your pastors at Journey. I have a few things to go over with you before we receive our tithes and our offerings. I wanted to remind you that in your packet, there is a communication card. So you can take that out, particularly if you're visiting with us. But I also have another um, opportunity for you to think about. So who is already in your life that's that messy person? You can't write your own name down because we already know that, that you qualify. We all do. We're all journeying toward God. But who is already in your life that's that Naaman that we talked about today? So write their name down, maybe just a first name, so that we can be praying with you about that, so that as you leave here today, you can take that message and start to, uh, to live it out by praying for that person. We'll join you in that. And if you don't know what to say to that person, uh, if they started asking questions, then talk to someone that has one of these red things around their neck, and, and we can talk with you. We can help you. We can um, rehearse with you, whatever it takes to get you prepared to be some of those people in this passage we looked at today. So our ushers are going to come forward now to receive your tithes and your offerings and that communication card. Also, there's that card in there that's the update card. You don't need to keep filling that out every week, but if you have not filled that out in the last few weeks, go ahead and fill that out today. It's the last day. That's to update our records. If the um, basket goes by too quickly, just give that information to someone with the red tag. I have some things I want to go over with you that are coming up. So we have, um, this is the last of our series. We're going to talk more about that in a second. We're starting a series next week on a book of the Bible in the New Testament called Colossians. We thought of a really cool name for it, Colossians. How about that? It's about a, a church that was struggling to figure out how to live with Jesus. And we qualify and we'll get good lessons from that. On the 11th, we have a child dedication coming up. There's a card in your packet about that as well. That's an opportunity for parents to come before God and before their family and friends and their community and dedicate themselves to raising their children in a way that they would know who God is and have a relationship with Jesus. So you can uh, look at that and sign up online. That's coming up quickly. And then we have an event called the Wedded Game that's coming up on the 16th. So this is an all-church event. There's kind of two parts to it. We're going to have a, a potluck out in the lobby that you can come to um, first, and then we're going to come into this room. And if um, some of you remember the newlywed game, some of you have no idea what that is, but we're going to do a version of a newlywed game. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick four random people from our studio audience, which would be in here, and we're going to put them up here, and we're going to separate them, and we're going to ask the wives four questions, and they're going to, husbands are going to come and try to guess the answers and get points, and then we have the wives leave, and then the husbands come, and we ask them questions. So for whether you're married or not, um, you can come and laugh at people who are. <laughs> Why would they do such a thing? Get married and then be ridiculed. So we're just going to have fun with marriage on that night. So that's for everyone to come. So this is the last of our series on 2018, our best year yet. Um, I didn't bring this coffee cup up here because I can't live without coffee. That's true. I can't live without coffee, but I can at least go through five minutes. But you know what can happen in a series like this? We go four weeks in January each week. We talk about how you can be a part of making this our best year yet. And then we march on into the rest of the year and we forget about our 2018, our best year yet. In order for God to make 2018 the best year yet with us, it's going to take all of us to do that. So we want to give you a coffee cup so that in the mornings or all day long, if you're like me as you're drinking coffee, you can look at that and remember your church and remember that you're a part of making 2018 the best year yet. And also in your packet, there's this little black card. It's easy to get lost. So look for it because there's two activities that you can do that you can do to make it the best year yet. And on the back side, there's six values that you can start to practice to live out to make it our best year yet. So you can put this in your Bible. You can put this on your dashboard. Just don't read the fine print while you're um, driving. And then put it on your fridge. We'll have the, them displayed on the wall. So if you lose a card during the year, you can pick up a card. Because we don't want to forget about these four weeks that we spent together in order for it to be our best year yet. It's going to last all year long. So we're glad that you were here today. We're glad that you're going to help make it our best year yet. 
and be thinking about that messy person in your life and be praying for the opportunity that God will lead you toward to talk to them about him. Be blessed as you go. Bye-bye. Some say push on through. After all, it's the least that you can do. But don't buy what they're selling. Couldn't be further from the truth. Press on.